What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Our Landscapers Working at Chuck's House Today with your hosts, Robbie the <laughs> Wagner and Charles William Carpenter the Third. Yes, and for those who want to know, it is not happening. Landscapers were here early this morning. Mm. And uh, yeah, so in recent recordings, dear guest, I've had this challenge because I'm working now out of a former shed and landscapers in the neighborhood create quite an echo. Anyway, so fun fact, <laughs> not happening today. So, but for real, welcome everyone to another episode of Whiskey Web and Whatnot featuring your hosts, Charles William Carpenter III and Robbie the Wagner. Indeed, indeed. Yes. So our guest today is Ben. And actually, Ben, I should have asked you how to pronounce it correctly. Rumsch. Rumsch <laughs> is what I want to say. Away. Rummage. Yes. It's rummage. rummage. Yeah, rummage. rummage. I, I yep. bet Robbie would have gotten it right. I'm, so I'm terrible at pronunciation. <laughs> yes. So CEO and co-founder of Flagsmith. That's and right. Yeah, that's right. And New Orleans Saints fan. Well, I mean, that was a team that was thrust upon me. They, they were playing in, in Wembley in London. Uh, my buddy who's from New Orleans came across and bought me a ticket and we drank some beer and watched a really bad game of American football, actually. Huh. That's reasonable. So that's the affiliation. Yeah. All right. We won't Do you think they're it. all bad compared to No, European no, no. no. I, I, used, okay. I used to watch. I used to, <laughs> so I was quite into it when I was a teenager. So okay. I do know what a good game of football looks like. This wasn't right. it. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, for those who don't know who you are, why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Yeah, Outside cool. Of, life, of course. So yeah, I, my name's Ben. I live in London. I lived here pretty much all my life. I was running a web agency for the last 23 years. And about... Six and a half, seven years ago, we started a side project that became Flagsmith. And now I'm working full time on Flagsmith. So it's, it's growing like a weed and we didn't raise any money. 97% of the code's open source. And yeah, I've, I've got a very, very strong imposter syndrome. <laughs> <basically>. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to get into that then. But first, in order to quell I'm also interested sure. in that other 3%, but we'll get into that later too. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's true. <laughs> that's it. That's the key yeah. point, right? That's, that's the money shot, so they say. All right. So today we're having the Redwood Empire Lost Monarch. And this is a very interesting one. It's a blend of four 12-year-old bourbons and three to five-year-old whiskey. So 60% of this blend is rye, and that rye's mash bill is 95% rye, 5% malted barley, the other 40 being that mishmash of 12-year-old bourbons, 40% mm -hmm. of it, and the so mash bill there. it's got something in there. It's definitely got something. 75% corn, 21% raw rye, which this is interesting. I've never seen mm -hmm. a distinction there. And 4% malted barley, and proof down to 90 proof to make it palatable for everybody you know grandmothers children whatever yeah grandmothers typically drink whiskey straight is what i've found yeah. you know that's what maybe they in say. kentucky <laughs> well okay in kentucky at least they would take a little like dip your finger in whiskey and put it on babies like when they're teething and stuff to help numb it so mm -hmm. i don't know it yeah, seems to that. have yeah and that's how you get adults that are alcoholics is that the uh a very good play about the troubles in Ireland called the ferryman and it's set in a kitchen in a house in Northern Ireland and there's like seven kids and it's Christmas and all of them just pile into the whiskey on Christmas morning. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> That's a special occasion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there are no alcoholics in Ireland, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, no, of course not. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's let's give a little dive into this. I'm gonna. You're having some, right, Ben? You're in. Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, I'm right. here. Oh, okay. There you go. That that cup was full just a minute ago. <laughs> hmm. I'm smelling some rotisserie chicken. 
No, that's a lie. That's bullshit. I'm I'm calling that one. This is you just trying to test it out how suggestive you can be. And you don't smell it? No, I don't at all. Hmm. It is slightly floral for me. I've got a lot of vanilla. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A little like, yeah, a note of that. All right, I'm going to give it a little. And like some sort of buttery caramel. Butterscotch almost. Yeah. Yeah. Get a little of that. A little cinnamon on the finish. And I still get mm. like a light floral. Yeah. Hints of where there's originals. <laughs> there you go. Those, <laughs> those were good. I'm sure they, they still were. Good. They're still good. You're, yeah, we're just not just quite old good. enough to keep them in our purses yet. Right. Exactly. You get those from a grandparent or something of that nature. Hmm. Yeah, no dried apricot whatsoever hmm. in this. So, and it's true. Yeah, not not really any citrus at all. Hmm. Not the said citrus mix. Kind of very buttery finished. Only thing like yeah, yeah, it's kind of like cream. Yeah, yeah. I definitely. I was trying to kind of place that. Like it hangs out for a bit. Yeah. It almost has like a thickness to it. It's got a little more burn than I would have expected too, coming from just 90 proof. But hmm, it's very interesting. Yeah. It, it almost has like a slight, like a slight tinge of bitterness, like from like a beer or something, you know, like a, like if you have something with like, like an IPA or something, a light one that, that has a little linger, it almost has that for me as it, as it dissipates. Hmm. All right. Should we rate this thing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Explain the rating system, Robbie, please. Okay. I'll try to remember. It's very complicated. <laughs> so it is zero to eight tentacles, zero based because we were developers. We used to do one to eight, but changed it. Zero is like worst thing ever, would never touch it again. Four is middle of the road and eight is like the best thing you could possibly have. You know, you're going to drink this above all other whiskeys. We'll make Chuck go first. Mm, I'm so proud of you for remembering that. <laughs> uh, okay. It's very interesting. It's obviously like, it's hard for me to categorize. So Robbie and I will like oftentimes try to categorize because we have so much whiskey through this. We just try to like compare it to others of the same category. I don't know. This is really like more of like a experimental blend for me. Like I know those wolves ones that we had, they were like stout based and some weird stuff like that. I almost think about it like that. Yeah. I don't recall price point. I don't know, 60, 70 bucks, maybe something like that. I yeah. I don't, I don't think it was too crazy. Yeah. So I do think it's very interesting. It's not like it. it's not, blowing me away but it is very drinkable and i yeah i kind of keep coming back to interesting i'm gonna try more and i will probably eventually add a couple of drops of water and see how that opens it up but i think in that category of things it's like it's definitely above average it is interesting price point not too crazy i think i'm at like a 5.5 yeah would would have again still exploring it okay uh, yeah, for me, it's going to be, I think, maybe a little higher. Like, this is pretty good, I think, and it's interesting. Yeah, I don't know what category it's in, really, but um, I'm definitely going to drink a lot more of this, and <laughs> I don't always do that with the ones we try. So I'm going to actually give this one a 7. I'm pretty impressed with this one. Okay, I like it. All right. What do you think, Ben? So I'm more of a peated person, mm. and generally I find... I find it hard to separate non-peated whiskey. Mm. But the interesting thing about this is it's got a very sweet kind of, you know, smell, but there's quite a kind of nice harshness to it as well. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm not getting the peat, obviously, because it's not peated, but yeah, you don't have that kind of, I just don't like the kind of long sweetness you get with a lot of unpeated whiskeys, but this, this kind of like the harshness kind of like kicks through there and gives you something else to think about. So, I mean, I, I drink pretty much anything. So 
the bottle won't last long in this in this room over the next few weeks. But I'd I'd drink it again. I'd give it a five, I think, maybe four and a half or five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You won't throw okay. it out. That's good. <laughs> and uh, you said the next few weeks. I think you. I think you said days wrong. Well, but... maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, depends who's listening. Yeah. There you yeah. go. <laughs> hey. All right. So we will uh, we'll take that and we'll roll it into the segment of the show that we call hot takes and hot being very subjective, but. We just like to look at the things people argue about online and developers are very passionate about their ways of doing things and tools and whatever else. So we take some of those hot takes and, and ask here to our guests and each other. So I'll, I'll take the first one. Okay. So Ben, will AI take over our jobs? No. <laughs> and why? Well, <laughs> see, I, I've made a career out of not jumping on bandwagons. Having said that, AI is probably the most legitimate bandwagon that I've not hitched my ride on. And actually, just before we started recording, I was looking at Claude. Oh, yeah. There's another business that I'm involved in has a really perfect use case for using AI. But the reason I'm so certain about no is because the jobs that we have will just become kind of higher level feel, right? Like if it could write unit tests, great, right? That's really boring. Yeah. I'm happy for it to do that. And if it can even start writing a Django code or React components, then great. But when it comes to, you know, I just feel like the, the role that we have will become a little bit more like every, like it's been doing in computer science for decades and decades and decades. It just becomes more of an abstraction. But so maybe, maybe our roles will change, but I don't think it's not going to be like 90% of software engineers lose their jobs in the next 10 years. I just, I don't. I can see that. Yeah. I kind of yeah, concur I, too. I think it's like, it depends on exactly how you mean, because I think it's really hard to be a junior and get into the field now because it's like, why would we hire you? We can just like type on a keyboard and get some AI to generate what you would do because you're going to not do a good job. So it's like, I think most of the people that are more senior are pretty safe for That's the foreseeable an future. Point. I yeah. haven't considered that. That is, that is a very good point. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's a tough time to get into this field um, because, like, there's so many people that got laid off, too, that are, like, looking for jobs. So there, no one's hiring juniors right now. Right. Yeah. I, I can see it kind of equalizing the playing field to a degree. Like, the, if the bar to entry is higher because you need to understand and do so much more to sort of provide the value there, or like fill the gap af beyond a certain thing, but also I think regressively be able to review and edit, you know, the output of these AI interfaces. So like, you know, it's like maybe it becomes more refined, like, oh, you know, lawyers go to law school beyond and maybe there's something like that. There's additional training. There's a higher bar that, that comes into play before you're able to enter the profession. I don't know. It's hard to say. I think in so many ways I agree with you, though, that, like, yeah. we as humans aren't going away as part of this. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like I just, I, I find that I'm, I'm, I'm already tired of that question, right? Like, and not I'm going to go at you for asking it, but the kind of, it's, it just feels like, you know, like the Luddites complaining about the steam powered factories, like, you know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's got a bit of, you know, that we, this is a 300 year old argument a little bit. Yeah. And I just kind of feel like it's more, it's, you know, like all these new jobs that are going to be created by it and all this sort of stuff. So, I mean, I do, I do find it fascinating that kind of illustrators are the first ones who've been properly kind of you know maybe not but that that's that i would never have expected that 
Oh, it turns out that you know, illustrators are the ones that are really in the firing line. Yeah, yeah. that's wild to me. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. I did not consider that at all, but it's easy to like replace the idea of even like stock imagery just by mm -hmm. 10 minutes of prompts. Like it, in, yep. in six months, 12 months, it's just so common to see, I don't know, like blog posts or Twitter posts with what it's kind of amazing as well. You can immediately tell that they're AI generated images, right? Um, well, I guess that would, that would get better as well, but yeah, like that's just commonplace now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We use it for the, the art for the show. So there you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to show you AI, Ben. It's going to be great. <laughs> Yeah, you get what you get. I don't spend that long on it. So <laughs> you get what you get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next one here Rails or Django? I mean, <laughs> either, both. I don't know. Mm. Uh, I haven't used Rails Depends. for quite a while. It's kind of a little bit. It's got more going on than Django, right? Like it's got the kind of more dynamic front end stuff and shuttling things back and forward and things like that, which I guess you can do with some other libraries in Django. We built Flagsmith on Django primarily because it let us build a REST API really, really quickly. Oh yeah. With Django REST framework. So thank you to all those people that built those <laughs> tools. Um, but it's, it's, it's held up really well, right? Like the bits of the application that we need to be super performing or everything else is good enough kind of thing. Like it doesn't break. It's absolutely rock solid in a high load environment. So, you know, I, but I'm sure rails would be as well, but for us, I mean, it's kind of in, it's kind of credit to to Django that it did what it did at the start really really well, which is why we chose it. But it's maintained. You know, it's kind of impressive that it's maintained that as we've scaled the platform. Yeah, yeah, like it's still highly relevant. It feels like mm -hmm. it's bubbling up as the list of uh, battle-tested frameworks comes back to light of like, oh, maybe we don't need to over-engineer everything and use 64, like, cloud SaaS products with freemium yeah, models. Just 63. Yeah, yeah. We only need 63. Planet scale <laughs> is gone now, so not really, but they, they're not 40 freemium. bucks a month. It's not yeah, gone. For, right, yeah. Well, And that has people aghast. But anyway, mm -hmm. I mean, 40 bucks a month for a hobby project is, of course, you know, whatever. Not awesome, but I, I, yeah, I'm way off track here. Well, then in that vein of thought, I think this is another good one. It's, were front end frameworks a mistake? <laughs> I don't even feel qualified to answer that question because I haven't written any front end code for about 25 years. Although mm. I, I did, I did have, I did have. HTML that I'd written on the BBC weather homepage in 1998, which I'm quite proud of. There was lots of single pixel transparent GIFs and it, yeah, yeah, transparent GIFs, yeah. And yeah, so I'm, I'm not, I don't feel qualified. I mean, they're kind of a bit. It, Everyone complains about them and the and the the churn and whatever, but yeah. again, we chose React for the dashboard for for Flagsmith, and you know, yeah, that is. Was that a technology decision or a hiring decision? Though, well, it was just what we what we what we knew. But again, like you know, I mean, I mean, Django is really old now, right? And I React know. is pretty old as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm pretty old. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know, like. Yeah, they're like, again, they're tested. Yep. I don't, you know, I don't, I think, I think the, I think the sort of wars around them is what's tiring. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Because most of the like problems that people are arguing about are very like nuanced, very specific use case or just 
just opinion, just about like, I don't like doing this thing. I don't think that's the best way. Right. Robbie will chime in on that. He, he wishes everything was still class components. So. Yep. You know, I, I like classes. Like you think about stuff like classes, whether you're using a class or not, don't even pretend like you don't like anyway, it's all, I don't, don't want to go down that path. Know. Yeah. Fair enough. Let's see. Get rebase or get merge. I, <laughs> I, I set up a configuration in Git years ago that works really, worked really well for me. And I don't actually know <laughs> which it does. I just, <laughs> have, I just have like the workflow with some yeah. shortcuts and hmm. I think it's rebase, I guess. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, Whatever the magic does, that's I, also a pretty yeah. good answer. <laughs> I keep yeah. I keep meaning to sit down and spend an hour learning how Git actually works and never get around to it and feel like it would be one of those things that would be a really, really valuable investment. You know. <laughs> I, I feel like there's people that know it really well and I'm like, I don't I don't need to do that. Like if I have a really hairy conflict, I'm probably just gonna like copy the stuff that I want to keep yeah. and paste it into the main <laughs> branch. Like it doesn't matter. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel like if you're in some like advanced cherry picking situation, like to fix or roll back Matt, you know, production, I have to like ask why your process requires that, you know, what kind of like CICD process you have that is is fucked up enough to to do it. I've had to do it a couple of times in life and I do not recommend it. And I always just have to dig into documentation for a bit to like, all right, something got screwed up. This is the way to fix it. That means something is very fragile here. So I'm going to just, yeah, take my time. I think you know. also GitHub does a really good job of just kind of shielding you from ever having to get into that dark yeah. room which is <laughs> yeah. scary do you know what i mean it's really like yeah we i it the workflow that we've got building flags but now there's only like seven people developing on it but it's it's like you know compared to what life was like 20 years ago it's just amazing and yeah i, I always find it interesting how GitHub sort of greases those wheels and sort of shields you from the weird flags that you need to put in every now and again and just pray that. Yeah, it all works out. Yeah. <laughs> Looks good in the end. And you can go a step further like Robbie and do the GUI. Yep. Yeah, I use their GitHub desktop and it's great. Yeah. Sublime Merge is really good. That's I, I use that from time to time. Not often, but it's it's that's a really great tool as well. Yeah, I strongly recommend people check that out if they terrified <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's valid. Well, let's see here. Oh, I guess it is me. I have to ask yeah. about what do you think about nested terranaries? I don't even know <laughs> what they are. Oh, hang on, ternary, right? Yeah. Nest oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. Nested oh, yeah. It's ternaries. my it's my weird it's my weird freedom accent. You know, it's all <laughs> it's a little like this, and sometimes you don't understand what all I say. But I said ternaries, not turn turn ternaries. <laughs> I don't know how can I make it worse. But. It's it's actually interesting. Like with this, there's so there's kind of Pythonic people and React type scriptsy people and. I always I just kind of get the feeling that sometimes JavaScript or TypeScript developers spend a lot of their time trying to show off, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I, don't I mean, the think, whole thing is showing off now. That's how we ended up with those frameworks. <laughs> like, Python people wouldn't think of doing that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's if-else for a reason, maybe. Or switch statements or yeah, a billion other switch, cleaner, yeah. easier to, yeah, 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 to reason about. So, yeah, I think that's fair. That's a, that's a pretty good answer in that, like, from the Python world, you just wouldn't even think about trying that. Yeah. It yeah. just but, doesn't but make But JavaScript sense. people have been living in, like, 
87 nested callbacks for so long that yes. a, a nested ternary seems like this kind of like yeah this is the easy life basic yeah. stuff yeah. you also it's easier in javascript because you can never press like you don't have to do any spacing like you do in python you could just like type it all out and then auto format it so oh, like you can yeah. be really gross about it and then be like don't care <laughs> yeah. It is the Wild West still in so many yeah. ways. It's kind of funny. Oh man. All right, I gotta I gotta fill up here. Yeah. You know. All right. So yeah, we do want to get into a little bit about Flagsmith here. Do you want to give just a, a quick pitch into what it is, what you use it for? Yeah, sure. So Flagsmith is a open source feature flagging platform. So it's a collection of an API of React in, in Python, Django, React front end, a dashboard, and then SDKs in too many languages that Chuck and I were talking about earlier, <laughs> which mm -hmm. are, it's really hard work keeping SDKs polished and up to date and in line with each other and not upsetting the people who write in those languages. And that's the hardest part. Feature flags are a kind of a engineering technique that allow you essentially to decouple deploying your code with releasing your features. So up until maybe seven or eight years ago, that's how, you know, deploy your code and then all your stuff's released. And if you then don't, don't want to release it because it's all broken, you're kind of just rolling back and database schema change reverts and all this sort of stuff. And um, flags allow you to toggle in your code features or behaviors or user journeys or whatever, switching on and off. And there was a kind of set, there was two, two sort of seminal sort of blog posts about feature flags, one by Flickr back in the day, and another one by Martin Fowler. And they're still kind of contentious, right? Like a lot of people, some people think that, you know, their idea, oh, introduce kind of like as habits or whatever. But we, 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 as I was running this agency, we were doing work with these large enterprise organizations and they could, they just couldn't release the code. They could not release the code. They, they couldn't deploy it. They had multiple teams with cross-dependent things that you know some tests were failing and they'd punt the release and then they'd punt the release and then they'd punt the release mm. and we were like what the hell is going on now like, suddenly <laughs> they've got like four months of work they need to deploy it because the CTO is getting you know destroyed in board meetings and we were like no this, this is nuts because we were in the, the consultancy we were in the middle of this like just yeah. trying to keep our heads down and not stress out, but yeah, so that's where the idea came from. And yeah, we open sourced the project. It was a side project of the agency. We open sourced it. Back then there was, there was like a couple of commercial providers out there and there was us and, and Unleash who were the other sort of earlier open source projects. And, and yeah, it's, it, it's sort of grown pretty slowly at first and organically and then just before covid i started working on it full time and now we're 15 people profitable just about we, we kind of dial have that dial set just about profitable you know more <laughs> months than not and yeah it's 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 really great fun it's 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 been Really interesting running a, an open source project that's completely new to me and uh, yeah, we, you know, we'll, we'll see where, we'll see where the, the boat takes us, but we, we're not, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we're not VC funded. So we've not got, you know, this, this, this sort of preordained path of, you know, go big or, or. And they lay lay most of the company off the thing. So yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Like you, growth driven, tons of money, 
collect users, let them come in for free for, you know, a very long time and then start to turn, you know, squeeze switch. the juice a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's what Launch Darkly was, right? Initially, didn't they open, like, kind of launch with a more freemium model? You know, it's like the first one's free. Once you start getting deeper and having more calls, then, you know, the, the bills go up. And and people have, you know, once you're really invested in this path, which, you know, to be fair, I do agree with a, I don't know, bad habits or not kind of thing. Like you said, when you have multiple collaborators, you want to, like, keep shipping but maybe it's not ready for prime time but you also want the ability to like test in a real environment and all this kind of there's a ton yeah. of use cases for feature flagging that i think is yeah. positive or but, like um, your teams aren't on the same page like often we'll release a front-end feature and it'll be six months before the back end's ready so like yep you need a feature flag for that because you don't want to let the branch sit there for six months you want to yeah. like get it merged and then just wait to turn it on yeah because i mean you let a branch sit for six months you might as well close it and just start yeah, the work later yeah yeah so actually I, I i do think like from the experience that i've had now i i i actually i'm coming to the sort of point where i feel that probably the most valuable thing that they introduce to you uh you is the 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 capability of removing almost all of your environments and i think that generally and this isn't you know obviously in engineering there's no there's no sort of like golden bullet for everybody, but reducing your, the number of environments you have and, and aiming to get to, to one, not, not maybe as a, as a kind of a panacea rather than an actual, like we have to get to production environment. Yeah. I think that's probably the most valuable thing you can test in production. Everyone's yeah, I was just going like, to say, you're advocating for testing in production. Though. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but you can test yeah. in production. You can do it in a really safe way. Right, right. Because no one else and, can see it. That's yeah, true. Like, yeah. You know, and like, I mean, oh my God, like, I feel like some of the projects that we worked on, probably half the bugs were like a configuration issue in like some random environment that someone had decided to stand up. Yep. You know? And then it's like, well, if, it, you, if you don't know if it's going to work in that one, then you definitely don't know if it's going to work in production. So what are we doing? Yeah, yep. yeah, and the idea that like staging is production like almost completely yeah. untouched. It's never quite the same. It's though, never yeah. quite the same. Like, oh, the database is a little different. We have security, you know, compliance issues, and we can't yeah. copy the database down or whatever it is. There's always a reason why you never have a full fledged copy of production. But then you have this. But it's like, and yeah, I mean. Reducing environments is, is, is an awesome use case because mm -hmm. I can think of even in recent history, so many times where you will have like a shared QA server and, and different people are pushing different code to that at different times. You know, have like four teams w having their own kind of roadmap and sharing like a QA server except like you never truly have integration until you get to production. <laughs> And so how are you actually ever testing this? You're, you're never certain. And then, you know, all hands on deck, everything's on fire because we didn't know this was going to happen, even though we have overlapping priorities. So that does seem like a very strong one. The other thing we noticed was like, it would always be the best engineer on the team who would be the one like figuring out all these configuration differences because the best engineer on the team is the, the one who's got like the most understanding of how all these different things fit together right and you know we were like at one point we were doing this big project for a bookmaker in the uk and i realized at one point that like the lead engineer that we were providing to the customer was basically spending his entire day every day just like dealing with this stuff and yeah, yeah like you know funny. and like well why doesn't this thing work in that in environment because of this and da, 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 da. right you know so it's like the mo the most expensive person on the project or the most va the one that could deliver the most value was the one who was sat like staring at environment variables for pre pre prod you know and it's <laughs> oh gosh why are you doing that yeah. like well i understand yeah. why you're doing it i just explained why he's doing it but like yeah why are you doing it you know yeah like why do you yeah. settle for that 
Why is that right. good enough? Why is like they're never a priority? Uh, yeah, I always find that amazing that it's like you would continue to waste that kind of expensive time and expertise then likely burning someone out. So they're going to go do something else anyway. Well, it, 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 it. She resigned after that project, right? Absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you, you we've been working predict- together for like twelve years. Yeah, you couldn't predict it any any better. And instead, you would rather go through all of that to ship more features, quote unquote. You know, so so much validation and business value. Like, yeah, I feel like there's a there still is like quite a fallacy in in mm-hmm. in the product software product inter- uh, industry around what is valuable to the business and whether it, you know, becomes like a product ideology or if it gets, oh, that's an engineering problem. Like not necessarily because delivery and, you know, business value, user happiness, all these things can be wrapped up in these, these bits in tech debt in you know, having to like chase terrible environment scenarios, like just unfuck your process. Come on. The other thing that's interesting is like this, you know, in some ways the engineering, you know, front end frameworks or whatever move very quickly, right? And no one's going to go like, you know, if so, someone turns up and goes, oh, you know, there's this front end framework, it's really good, we're going to write it in that. Which is an entirely risky proposition. But there's, see, there's still these shibboleths who it's like, well, why don't we just delete these five environments because they're crap. No yeah. one uses them and they're just, you know, like everyone's like, oh, you can't do that. Like, you know, like, I, tell, I, I don't know why that is, but, you know, you can turn up and go, oh, I found this new front end thing that we're going to use and no one knows if it's going to be maintained and have security patches in like two years. But yeah. if you try and, you know, argue against something just because everyone's, it's, 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 it's just bad engineering practice, right? Like just because you've been doing it for 25 or four years doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, well, I feel like there's two aspects there. I feel like that if you've been in a place long enough, a fear of letting go of anything means that you may, may never get it back, right? Like if you have to, you know, ask IT to spin up environments or, provide you with additional space or giving you a account allocation on AWS, you know, all of those things. As soon as you say, I don't need this right now, you may never get it again. It's kind of like headcount, right? Like as soon as you lose someone yeah. because of attrition. Spend all your money because if you don't, you'll get less money next time. Exactly. Yeah. So you got to spend yeah. your budget. You need yeah. to make sure your <laughs> like headcount allocation stays around. Like anything that gets reduced, you feel like you're not going to get it anymore. So I, I understand that. It's just not logical. And then, yeah. right, yeah. And then, yeah, like, new shiny thing. It's kind of funny because, like, people complain about, like, some fatigue around all these new technologies coming out all the time. And they're cool to explore and stuff. And I think it's probably a little more, like, show off and talk about than than real-world application. Like, honestly, you know, React is everywhere. Like, how many... Svelte applications are there some there are a lot of them are More hobbies or startups like you know you're not going to if you think about i don't know why you know you think about you know wendy's or something right like fast food restaurant like they're not exploring Svelte right now how do you know right how i do don't you think know? so i think that they're selling <laughs> burgers just fine and they're like i'm gonna react tweet has been, react we'll has been selling say. yeah fine React has been selling our burgers since 2014, and we're just going to stick with it because of maintenance, because of hiring or whatever else. Although now I bet anybody would take yeah. any, if, if you're out in the marketplace and you get asked to write Ember.js, you're like, sign me up. Is there a paycheck yeah. with that? I'll take it. But also like React hasn't released a new version in over a year. Yeah. Like yeah. everything else has. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think that. the writing's on the wall there. After after server components, maybe we can bury it. I don't know. Mm. And that's a controversial opinion. Yeah, that before I we get them fully released, let's just quit that. And then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's stop before this comes for sure. Yeah. 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 Not just in Canary and next. I just looked it up. Django's 18 years old and React is 11 years old. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm good with that. Right. 
Yeah, like yeah. those work. I mean, I went through this, you, and I've mentioned this before on the show, but whatever. It, I went through this a little bit when I was starting to work on Shepard Pro features and, and an app there. I actually started writing an API. A stand, I was like, I'm going to do separate, a little more microservices architecture here, right? So I'm going to do the initial API, and there's this new, like it's basically the new Express. It's called Alessia, and it is really cool. It's uh, using the bun runtime, like it's 100% type safe. It just, it had, the ergonomics are really cool and it was kind of fun, but it also is like, it's new. So that means you have to do a lot yourself. And then also when I started exploring the deployment story, like your options are a bit more limited. They are a little bit more hands-on. I was like, ah, I don't know if this is a good idea for me. So then I went to look at Redwood JS and, and Django and spent a weekend playing with both, had fun with both. And I just haven't done Django in a long time. So I was like, am I going to relearn this? I'm just going to mm -hmm. go to Redwood because it's React. Did I make Graph you get it on the brackets with... train? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get on the brackets <laughs> train. That was part of it. I must have brackets in my code according to, to Robbie. But like it comes with auth. It was easy to set up a mailer. It was like... You could set up like server like functions like standalone API functions on on your own, so you can create web hooks. Like it just comes with so much yeah. already done for me. I just want to build. Great. Yeah, you should use batteries included stuff so that you can focus on your domain specific features, and you don't have to like build all that crap to get started. Yeah, that's what I think too. Like yeah. it's almost like we we're talking about with AI, like the bar, just, just, just get a head start. Just go here. AI can do some of that legwork for you. It'll make you more efficient because, you know, get you past certain points and then you're smart enough to deal with ABC things. I mean, Robbie isn't, but I am, I'm smart enough. To <laughs> deal with I, I can only do A and B things. Not C is a little hard for me. Mm-hmm. So I'm very curious because we're talking open source, we're talking projects, we're talking Flagsmith, what it, what it, you know. So I think, I feel like, like commercial open source is starting to bubble up a lot. I like, you know, our industry has changed a bunch with the difference in, in finance markets and, and all of that. So there's no free money or less, much less free money out in the world. And so you're seeing like less like freemium open freemium cloud products and they just want to acquire users and growth, 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 growth. And we'll turn that into a unicorn. And there is a more of a realistic take, right? And people have started to look towards open source software and commercial businesses around that, which obviously you know a lot about, which is just an interesting business paradigm. Like how does that, how does an open source project start to become a profitable business by but exposing 97% of the secret sauce? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a big question. <laughs> I think the thing that I've noticed over the last several years is engineering folk generally, if you, if you can take the piss out of them and that depends on, you know, the project or whatever, but everyone kind of know, if you don't kind of pull the rug on them or then it's definitely more, you know, it's, it's not really, it's not religious, right? It's not the commercial part of it is, it, you know, 30 years ago, you know, with the free software movement, it was very religious. That's fine. I love Linux. I was playing with it in 1994. It's brilliant. Blah, 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 blah. The, there's definitely, you know, this is generations come and go. There's definitely a, a, a sort of like a tacit understanding that, you know, if you're, if you're not like abusive or rude to that relationship, then I'm trying to build a sustainable company. We try really hard to make the free version of Flagsmith really good and the bottom line is really, you know, if you're using it with a team of 10 engineers or less, you, if you squint, you probably wouldn't notice the difference between the 
the twelve thousand pound a year version of Flagsmith and the one that doesn't cost anything. Right. And then sounds we have a though. philosophy that I came up with a while ago about how the sort of TPS reports features the kind of non functional requirement features like like auth and and audit logs and sending stuff to Splunk and all of that stuff. We're going to charge like money for that because engineers don't care, right? Like engineers yeah. don't care about audit logs. Like some some weird ones. <laughs> most most engineers In general. Want to write, you know, they don't care. But they they, they care about you know, I don't know an Elixir client or being able to do this sort of like cool thing with with the. So we the the the, the philosophy the, the the sort of the open source philosophy of, of Flagsmith is that it's an engineer that. The lot that we never want an engineer to go, oh, I really wanted to do that, and that's the closed bit, and that's lame. Mm. Like, and we just really try really, really hard to build a, a business that's predicated on that on that basis, and then everything that basically engineers don't care about, if they are lame, that's what we charge money for. And actually, it turns out that the actual the amount the amount of code. That, that falls into those two brackets is, is you know, enormously on the stuff that's open and, and, and the stuff that's closed is, is, is relatively small amount of code. But it's not just that. They're, they're buying. They're buying support. And if they're sell, a, lot of, a lot of our customers are, are self-hosting, if they have a weird failure mode or they're putting, like, an insane amount of traffic through it and something's maybe you know like that's what they're paying for so yeah yeah like you know we kind of sort of consider this idea that well maybe someone you know chuck could fork it and build the wildworth and oxa and several integrations and you could do that just people <laughs> the reason the reason engineers don't do that is because that's it's kind of really boring other right? like yeah you know, so it's yeah. kind of like self reinforcing in that regard yeah and it, and and also I, I do think over time I do think people are less religious about it and you you don't we we, we never really get called out on it and you, know, you, you could you could as a, as a as an open source contributor or whatever you could legitimately make an argument about it and say like you know i think blah and this is why it's it's you know, your i don't know uh, it's your duty know, to using your yeah. own. no no one's done that like um you know and actually the probably the most interesting experience that we've had is is a lot of the big contributions to the platform have been from paying customers mm. So we have customers that are either like trialing us or buy the enterprise version and, and then they, they want, so we've, we've, we've got a customer at the moment, like one of their engineers has given us like a bunch of massive pull requests that are amazing yeah. just because they want functionality in the platform, um, and it doesn't exist and, and, and it's kind of. It's cheaper for them to get this one one engineer to build that stuff over two months and then and then make use of it than it is to stay on their incumbent platform and so that that's been like that I'm I'm constantly staggered by that like that that's very common yeah easily the the, the contributions outside of people who get paid to write the flagsmith code is is people who pay to to run it yeah yeah that's that's amazing that's in a very interesting circumstance that i wouldn't have considered but it does make a sense yeah. make sense if you're you know looking at a competitor that has this particular feature and then they look at you and you know like man ticks off 90 percent of the boxes and way more cost efficient except and to consider that, like, well, since it's open source, we could put right. it in there. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Like, that's a really, that's a great story around why 
that makes a lot of sense. And yeah. really, like you said, the boring stuff that matters for, you know, the specifics of running a business that, that a developer doesn't want to do. Great. We'll give you that, but that, you know, at a cost, like, why not? Yeah. And developers love that. Like if you're open source and your competitor is not, I'm always going to choose the open source one because I can see how it works and be like, oh, this is not working because of X, Y, Z versus like, I don't know, I got to contact support and like, my, it, who knows what's going on in there. But yeah. Yeah. And also like, if you do identify an issue, it's very transparent what is yeah. happening around that issue, 100%. right? Like, oh, cool. An issue's that's, in there. I, I know actually, it's captured. It's, it's not just the code that's open source. It's the, it's the, business the, the the engineering side of the business is open source as well so like we get this a lot where paying customer and well, maybe not like we're just maybe someone who's using it you know a hobbyist or whatever or pay you know they 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 find an issue and raise the issue you know through our support chat or whatever and then like, you know, like, like five minutes now in the perfect case. And this is what I love. And I, I, we, we do try and do this as much as possible. Put the issue on GitHub, send them the GitHub link, you know, two hours later, send them the pull request link. And then, you know, like two days later, send them the release link or whatever. And all of that is public. And obviously, yeah. you know, you have to be careful customer data and personal data and things like that and i've always worried that you know like it's it's kind of i don't know like that's always a, a concern but they're like oh my because because for some reason and they need to do this closed source companies don't do that right like i don't exactly. have a single i can't think of a single and there, there probably are but i can't think of a single closed source company that has a public issue track and they're amazing. It's like a superpower. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe how transparent you are. And it's like, well, there's a bug. We wrote this software and it's got a bug. You found it. There it is. Like other yeah. people should probably know about it because it's a bug. Like there's no, it's, it goes back to what I was talking about with the environments. It was like, why, why make those things? I mean, obviously, yeah, if there's, there's a class of issue that we have in a private repository because it's, you know, containing private information or, or, you know, commercially confident things or whatever, but why don't commercial and private software companies have a public issue tracker? I've got no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's actually a pretty clever idea. And it just is one mm -hmm. of the, like the, like tangential, uh, benefits to open source. It's like. It feels good. You know what's going on. You know, I mean, there's obviously dark sides to everything, but I think in general, like there's so many positives around it. And also like if you put all the work in and you want to add a business aspect to this, why can't you? And, you know, so I don't know. Seems like there's so many positives there. Yeah. So I do want to move a little bit into non-technical things here. Um, we always ask everyone, if you weren't in tech, what other career would you choose? Oh, I always wanted to be an author. Hmm. And actually I wrote a, a blog post that you, you read and mentioned to me, Chuck, where it's kind of annoying actually. Um, I hate write, writing 90% of the time if I'm just not in the right mood, but 10% yeah. of the time I absolutely love it. And I can't, I can't isolate what it is in my head or, or environment <laughs> or whatever that. What I makes that happen? Yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah, replicate like... that 10% thing. Really annoying. I guess that maybe that's writer's block, right? I don't know. I'm not. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I would have loved to have been an author and I, I spent it. Sort of late teenage years, like hoovering up. I don't know. Yeah, like sort of like British fiction and thinking, yeah, this is. But yeah, I mean, I don't think I. I think I'd be a terrible writer. 
<laughs> uh, but you know, <laughs> but like, if I if I could like you know re redesign myself before I was born with an ability to instead of computers, yeah, but, then probably been that. Yeah, yeah. The persona of writer is very appealing, I imagine. Yeah. So what I want to know is what's what's with the you know what what's with the obsession on Parappa the rapper anyway. <laughs> Wait, wait, I saw an old tweet where you complained about your your like oh. PS One CD. Oh the yeah, rapper, the rapper, which I remember that game. <laughs> I can't believe it was a game ever, but uh, anyway, it got so. Sad. So, I was born in 1975, which meant that I was at university when the place that just just as the PlayStation One was released. Yeah, and so I was kind of the absolute bullseye target Sony marketing this person is going to buy our console oh yeah and at the time I don't know I was curious about this because I can't imagine it would have played well in Sony Japan but Sony in the UK went really hard marketing into nightclubs oh and I'm not hmm. I'm, I'm talking about the nightclubs that stayed open until like 6 in the morning and had lots of techno music and stuff like that. Right. It would be very common in the clubs that I frequented to have PlayStation consoles there paid for by Sony. Huh. And hmm. they lent really into that culture. And that for us, the rapper like has basically got loads of sort of stoner culture. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're not even sub references, they're like blatant sort of like stoner culture references <laughs> um, and so we used to play a lot of Parappa the Rapper when I was a student and yeah. and then I finally got my PlayStation out and I, I found my Parappa it's one of the only discs that I've still got yeah and um, yeah it, it's got a scratch on it that causes oh. it to reboot after you've done the 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 the, the, the reggae frog <laughs> who's selling he's <laughs> selling skunks it's 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 just ridiculous so it's one of my it's just one of my favorite games so and actually like the the i looked on ebay the other day like the the the, the discs are like 50 quid they're like oh, that's, you know that's crazy yeah yeah, yeah. I, I have you tried the like the resurfacer thing yeah yeah, yeah oh just... no i haven't i mean i i can the thing is it's, it's actually I'm going to take it back to technical because you can get, I can run the emulators to, to, to run it, yep. but it requires, the game requires really, really, really good timing. Oh. And with the emulators and the way TVs are now and speakers and everything's delayed, right? It's yeah. annoying. Yeah. yeah. Everything's so delayed. Know. And so you, to do it. The, it, you, you don't have the same experience playing the game if you're running it through like an emulator and a modern TV and all this sort of stuff so I've got hmm. it's <laughs> <laughs> just the name of that there, game is <laughs> there it is yeah exactly <laughs> it's, it's right behind me and I yeah maybe Sorry, so what is that? And I was what it's something that skims the top of the disc, or yeah, there's like a repair thing that you can, yeah, put I used on it, it once and it yeah. worked, yeah, it worked, yeah, yeah it just mm -hmm. adds like an extra, it's it kind of like, like crevices. It's like it's, I thought it was more like like a rough toothpaste and it kind of like sands down the Maybe. scratch part, yeah, to get to like the next layer underneath or something. something I don't like know, that. I thought you it could was try it if it's yeah. already not working and it won't hurt. I mean, to try I, it. I could yeah. just. Buy one for thirty pounds. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, you it's could, like, I yeah. guess. Yeah, like if you could, uh, yeah, if you can get past the guilt of uh, just buying. But, something. But yeah, <laughs> so for those you... of you who've got no idea what we're talking about, it's it's just it's a great game. It's it's like the, the, do you, have you have you have you? I played it a long time ago, but I definitely the, played a, it. I remember how like it's quirky so weird, and funny it's it was. so odd, yeah, so, so weird. It's kind of very. It's like a dog, kind of like rapper dog. Sort of merge between American and Japanese culture and is it leveling the game to so this it's about this you have a rapper and he's trying to impress this girl <laughs> and he takes her to a picnic and then on the way back he really needs to 
So he, <laughs> he, he stops at a service station and there's a queue for the toilet and he, you have to wrap your way past, <laughs> past the people in the queue. You have to kind of battle wrap your way past the people in the queue. <laughs> yeah. And then if you complete that, if you complete that scene, it goes into the toilet cubicle and does this big poo. It's yeah. so weird. It's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's so funny yeah. that that was like your entry into the PS1 because I am <laughs> also Gen X. And I remember like walking into a game shop or something. I think it was like, I don't know, get your hair cut. And afterwards, I was like, oh, I'll walk in this game shop. And they somebody was like demoing Tomb Raider or no, I think it was not Tomb Raider, but Tomb Raider was a good one too. It was Resident Evil, the first Resident Evil. Mm. And I was like, what is this? This is incredible. And I bought a system on the spot. <laughs> right. I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I did I, I did the same. Actually, Matt, who I started Solid State with, we were at this management consultancy out of university and he had a Nintendo 64 with Goldeneye. And oh, I literally yeah. I watched mm. him play Goldeneye for about five minutes and I got in my car and went to the store <laughs> and bought oh, yeah. sixty four. Goldeneye was great. Yeah. yeah. Goldeneye was really good. That and Conquer's Bad Fur yeah. were some of my favorite. 64 yeah games. the n64 controller was so bad though like yeah it's why rough. did it have three things to hold i don't get it yeah and you only <laughs> ever held it in one way right yeah, yeah. you can yeah. get one like a usb one now because i have like this recall box emulator thing where you basically you can choose from like 40 systems and you know you got to get your own roms but and then i was like oh cool uh donkey kong or something and yeah, donkey 64 i don't remember what it was called and then got one of those controllers, and I was like, "Wait a minute! I hated these." Yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> you fell into that trap and got it yeah. again. Yeah, so. I got it. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, let's play these games like with the same controller my, with my son." And then I was like, "Wait, these are terrible." They were, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Go games are really good though. Goldeneye's got a really good story. I, I, I didn't realize that there's there's a lot that's been written about Goldeneye, but the team that wrote Goldeneye had like basically no video games experience whatsoever. So is there's, <laughs> there's been experience, situations like this before in engineering where like they don't know where the boundaries are. Yeah. So they, they just go and like come up with these ideas and just achieve them where other mm. people would be like, no, you, no, you, you know, can't you, do that. And they don't even try. Yeah. So we should hire people that don't know what they're doing and get better products. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> all, only hire juniors. That's what it is. Yeah. Only hire juniors. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. That, that game is, I mean, yeah. I, it's, it's hard to explain, that, you know, if you didn't grow up with 8-bit computers or whatever, like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's just a, an outstanding piece of art. I, I had the first NES, uh, the NES, and when it was like Nintendo Entertainment System, and it had the robot. And it would grab the gyroscope and then move it over to spin on a different thing. That was like, I don't know if anybody remembers, early 80s at like Castlevania. What is this? And then there was a there NES was a, before the NES? It's the original NES. So it's the same one that came with like Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. You had the gun where you like yeah, yeah, shoot, yeah. shoot ducks mm -hmm. on the screen. And then, but the yeah. very first version had this like little robot thing and it was like, Part of the game was you had to, like, in physically, you were controlling the robot to move, like, this little spinny top thing. It was called, like, a gyroscope oh. over to a different thing, and then that would react on the screen. Uh, oh, interesting. It was weird. I think they Yeah, they did a lot of interesting. They had, like, the power glove. and the, oh, like, the they, did, they did a lot of, glove. like, yeah, and they interesting had, they had the, like, things. Yeah, three weird 3D glasses as well. Do you remember those? They I don't. Mm -hmm. Not familiar with those. Yeah, they they like they had some like weird sort of Goggles yeah like three D hollow glasses that mm. yeah the, they were they were really terrible like the experience was awful. <laughs> I imagine, but they, like, they yeah, yeah. It, they, it's a mad company like yeah it's kind of like the glove like that thing was impossible to use but you were like the <laughs> power glove. And yeah. then you're trying it's to so play cool the game. To have. Yeah. yeah, it just never really worked. I don't know. Shit, it's like yeah. the gyroscope. It was shit. Yeah. All right, we are over time here. Where can people find out more about Flagsmith or follow you? Or what do you want to plug before we end? Well, 
<laughs> so I'm going to, I always do github.com slash flagsmith and that's somewhere on the internet. Four of my colleagues are going like the website, but <laughs> yeah. Look at the free code first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> github.com slash flagsmith. And then also we have a discord that's slowly growing that you can find from, from there. And yeah, like it's, yeah, we're, we're trying to make it easier to contribute code and, and have that barrier of entry as low as possible, but obviously it's tricky as the surface area grows and stuff, but you know, like anything like raising issues, support requests, documentation, PRs, anything like, yeah. Here it's I thought good. you were going to plead for someone to mail you a Parappa the Rappa that works. <laughs> if somebody has <laughs> one that, and thinks it's too me, weird, <laughs> please mail it to Ben. <laughs> you can send it to me and I'll take it. Yeah. It'll be fine. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks everyone for listening. If you liked it, please subscribe. Leave us some ratings and reviews. We appreciate it. And we will catch you next time. <laughs>